occur of the underlying. Um, that's okay. No. Um, and so they're really not sure of the underlying causes. So when you ask them, why don't you want to come go to school today? I'm not sure. Or my stomach hurts. And a lot of times parents have a hard time getting to the underlying cause. Um, so school refusal is when a child refuses to get into the school building and, or gets into the building, but really refuses to attend any classes. They may spend the day in the office or the social worker's classroom and anxiety and behavioral actions cause that school refusal. Some students also may report physiological symptoms that I'll go over in a little bit um, that really mirrors an illness. And then, um, yeah, so we can go to the next slide. All right, so these are the tiers of school refusal. So we start at that moderate state, and this is where Students start to express their anxiety and fear of going to school, but they're still going to attend. And when we look at this tier, we're really looking at working with the school social worker, starting that preventative um, phase of not getting into the emerging as severe. So reaching out to the school social worker or reaching out to an outpatient therapist if that child can really identify what's going on. Um, and then the next would be that emerging. So this is when kiddos refuse to go to school one to two days per week, but will go sometimes. So, so we're really seeing this when kids are refusing due to something within the school. So maybe there's a presentation or maybe there's something else going on during that week where they'll go some days, but not all the days. Um, so this is when we're gonna look at more of that outpatient, a little bit more intensive supports. And then if we're really not understanding the cause still and it starts to get a little bit more severe, we get into that top three tier of severe. And this is when Students refuse to go to school about three to five days per week, or they refuse to go to school at all. And that's when we're really going to look into those more severe supports outside. That could be like a partial hospitalization program, an inpatient program, or really bringing a team of experts together to help. And this is just something that we pulled from um, when children refuse school from Kearney and Albano. And this is the pathways to school refusal. So some of you might have some kids that are really in the beginning tiers. Some of you may be in the second tiers. And then some of you might be experiencing that third tier. So it starts with school attendance with like stress or pleads for non-attendance in the morning, but they will go. And then it turns into repeated behavioral concerns in the morning. So not getting out of bed, arguing, fighting about it. Then we're starting after those behaviors exist, we're looking at then tardiness in the morning and then the periodic absences of skipping class. Then we're jumping into really that tier two of repeated absences and or skipping or avoiding classes. So that's staying in the social worker's office or the main office, going to the nurse a lot. And then after that, we start getting into the more severe of complete absence from school during a certain period of time, and then complete absence from school for an extended. And so something we really wanna emphasize throughout our presentation is if your child starts to voice concerns about going to school and or they start saying they don't wanna attend, just don't wait until they're full on refusing. You really wanna start those preventative measures. So definitely contacting your teacher or your, uh, child's teacher or the school social worker and explain what's going on. And they're really there to help you and your child. So now I'm gonna go over the actual different types of refusal. So how we kind of look at this is like an umbrella system. We look at it as home-based refusals and school-based refusals. So there's two school-based refusals, refusal due to school-based triggers and or social and evaluative. And then we look at the home base where it's more um, like social in or anxiety due to not wanting to leave and get attention from someone at home and or staying for positive reinforcements. So the first one we're going to go over is um, the school-based refusal due to school-based triggers. And so this is when we call it a void. When children refuse due to fire alarms, loud teachers or peers, a sensory or loud noises, crowded hallways, play playgrounds. Um, the behaviors that you're gonna look for is like crying and panic the night before. So Sunday nights can be a nightmare for some parents um, or the morning of school. 
and really spending a lot of time in the nurses or social workers office to avoid a lot of kids will hide in the bathrooms to avoid like passing periods and or unsupervised areas in the school. So something that we're going to suggest during this time is really collaborating with the school social worker and or counselor or whoever may be in charge of like social services at the school. Um, sometimes with private schools, that can be the principal. Sometimes they have a counselor that's on site. Some days I think private schools are getting a lot more informed and having counselors and social workers within the school five days a week, which is excellent. Um, and then seeing what accommodations that they may be able to offer your child, such as like alternative placements for lunch or noise canceling headphones, anything that can make some of those things just less stressful. So we just wanted to give um, an example for each one of these and maybe some of you can relate to this. So does this sound like your child? On Sunday night, Sam starts saying that he is not going to school tomorrow. When asked why, Sam says the lunchroom or hallways are too loud and crowded. Sam often hides in the school bathroom for a prolonged amount of time and is typically late to class. So that's, we're gonna start seeing that of course, he's starting to refuse because he's avoiding the crowded hallways and other loud sensory noises. The next one is another school-based refusal, and this is going to be refusal due to social and or evaluative situations. So this is something we call escape. So they're trying to escape these situations. So this is when a child or adolescent refuses school due, due to social situations such as bullying, be, they're not vibing with specific teachers, lack of friends, workload that they're getting, and or conflict with peers, or an evaluative situation such as tests, performances, presentations, and or speaking or writing in front of others. And so sometimes we'll see kids isolate, have lack of engagement with their peers. Sometimes we're seeing nowadays with all the technology in the world, um, a lot of teens will start to engage more with peers online through video games. And so they're starting to isolate from in-person so that a lot of students in this stage have a fear of judgment. So it's easier to just kind of escape this and go on to like online gaming and um, interact with peers online. And so some of the suggestions that we're going to say are for social, have your child join a club at school, reach out to the school, see what clubs or activities they have, um, and sit down with your child and try and pick one. Also work on some of that like judgment and fear and do some like social stories with them, like if or sentence starters, whatever they can do to engage with peers in person. And then for evaluative, we would love if you could reach out to your child's teacher and explain exactly what's going on. More than likely, they want your child in class and they want to be able to support them. So first, see if the teacher has any suggestions. And then if not, ask your child if um, ask your child like what is really stressful in that classroom and then kind of come up with some accommodations that you can work on with the teacher, such as only be called on if their hand is raised or have the opportunity to present to the teacher one-to-one -one instead of the entire class. So one of the examples is Maddie states that she does not want to go to school in the morning. When asked why, she explains that she gets called on and does not know the answer often. She also explains that she often starts to sweat and feels panicky when the teacher calls on people randomly and thinks her classmates will make fun of her for saying the wrong thing. So the next, we're going to look at the home-based refusals. So the first one of the home-based refusals is attention in the home. Now, we have seen this escalate a lot after COVID. Everyone spent so much time with their family, and whether that was wonderful for some or not for others, a lot of kids started to really become attached to people at home. So the first one, this is um, primarily related to positive or extra attention and physical closeness provided by parents or other family members, whether it's a grandparent or a sibling. And so really you can see this presenting as crying, requiring significant reassurance and attention from one or more family members, getting to school, getting ready, getting to school, and then refusing to get out of the car. Like I said before, this is typically seen in younger children, so the elementary, some middle age, uh, middle school age, but after COVID, we're really starting to see this amp up in more 
um, of eighth grade, freshman, sophomore, and the high school years. And so um, some of the suggestions are, if possible, and I know this isn't feasible for everyone, but we've seen this be successful in the past of having someone else take your child to school every day, such as another family member or a friend's parent. Um, if that's not possible, we really, and I know it's terrible in the cold weather, um, and if feasible, walking your child to school, this is really going to avoid that getting out of the car situation. Cause a lot of times, you know, they'll pull up and then they just won't get out of the car because they don't want to leave you. Um, they would wish you could come into the classroom with them, but of course that's not something you can do. So just being able to walk them up to the door and then asking a trusted adult at the school to meet the child at the door or have your child go to school with a friend or support. We've seen in middle uh, school age kids in high school, typically they're not going to express these behaviors in front of their peers. It's typically in the home. And so if they're walking with one of their friends to school or even driving in the car, one of their friend's parents, they're less likely to exhibit these behaviors. Um, and then also just start having some separate time on the weekends and after school for exposure from your child being away from you. And so an example would be Olivia wakes up in the morning and complies with getting ready to school. Mom drives Olivia to school every day. Olivia makes it to school and refuses to get out of the car. Olivia reports that she does not feel good today and promises to go tomorrow. This is a continuous pattern. So something that we see with kiddos that are experiencing this type of refusal is a lot of bargaining. They promise they'll do it tomorrow or they promise that, you know, they're just not feeling good today. I will absolutely do it tomorrow. I'll go to my classes tomorrow. And then we wake up and it's the same cycle. And so sometimes when we hear and we're not um, completely understanding of these symptoms, then it's okay, they'll go tomorrow. And then it's just a continuous pattern. And so the last home-based refusal is positive reinforcements at home. We've also seen this amp up since COVID. I know, you know, the kids had a shorter day with e-learning and they had access to their all their electronics and stuff all the time when they were stuck at home. So we've really seen this amp up. And so this is when children and adolescents refuse to go to school for tangible rewards. For these children, missing school is simply just more fun than attending school. And we look at this as less of like an anxiety-based, but more of a behavioral-based refusal. And so you'll see isolation, bargaining, reporting being sick. If children know that their parents absolutely have to go to work that day. So we see this more in teens as well, because they know their parents have to go to work and that if they're old enough to stay home, they have to be left home alone and then they have access to all their things. Um, and so something that we're going to suggest is really creating a plan that entails rewards and or consequences. You really have to figure out that motivation behind your child. Are they motivated by grades? Are they motivated by losing their phone? Are they motivated by um, being rewarded with things? And so really that's your first step of figuring out what's going to motivate them because, you know, some kiddos, you can take everything away and they don't care. Some, if you take their phone away, it's the worst thing in the world. So you just have to figure that balance out. And then um, talking to your child, if you don't attend school, you'll not have any privileges. Something that we'll go over later is a um, refusal day agenda that we've created. And so not having any privileges, parents turning off the Wi-Fi, taking away the phone, turning off the service. If you go to school, you can have X amount of screen time. We've created plans where... Children go to one hour of school, so they get one hour of um, Xbox time or whatever game time at the night. Um, and then plans will definitely vary considering the age limit. And so Bennett, 14 year old, wakes up in the morning complaining of a stomach ache. He reports not wanting to go to school and refuses to get out of his bed with multiple reminders. Both parents cannot miss work, so Bennett stays home by himself. During the day, Bennett watches TV and plays video games. Now, these kiddos are very creative. So we'll have, you know, the Chromebooks taken away, the TV, and then what do you do? Oh, I watch YouTube on my TV or whatnot. They'll figure ways around it. So you just have to be really creative and consistent with this. And then before we move on to the next slide, which really touches on accommodations and uh, physio physiological symptoms, 
Some children might miss school for long periods of time due to, let's say, positive reinforcements in the home environment, but then later on must return to school and face peers and new classes and new teachers. So sometimes they start off refusing due to one, like the positive reinforcements, and then it could trickle into multiple different types of refusal because then they're nervous about facing their peers of talking about where they've been or the makeup work. So it's really, really important to start in that preventative phase. And so talking before about physiological symptoms, these are symptoms. They're not fake at all. They actually are real symptoms. So we want to talk about how like physiological symptoms in the body can come out as like my head hurts. I'm feeling like I'm going to throw up. And so these are real actual symptoms that your child is feeling due to anxiety, unless it's like the behavioral where they've learned, if I say a stomach ache, I get to stay home or kids were creative with COVID thinking, oh, I have COVID, I need to stay home. Or if I have the sniffles, I'll get sent home. And so it's really important to just educate your child and even like the school nurse at um, my child is reporting this over and over, but we've gotten this checked out. And it's really just important that knowing that, yes, this is a real thing they're feeling, but it is due to anxiety. And so when children start to feel these symptoms of anxiety, it can be really scary. And there can be times that children who have experienced these symptoms before tend to use them later on. Um, and so we really, really encourage you not to doubt it at first, but rule it out. Consult with your pediatrician, talk with the school nurse, make a trip to urgent care. Um, and then really setting those parameters with your child. You must have a fever or you must actually throw up if you in, in order for you not to go to school so that they know exactly okay, I can't just report a stomach ache I, or educating. Sometimes kids have these physiological symptoms, don't know what they are. And then once they're educated on, oh, okay, this is anxiety. I know how to practice deep breathing and grounding techniques. It can relieve some of that anxiety in itself. And then the next, we were going to talk about just a couple um, accommodations. I'm going to send this over to Nicole in just a minute. Um, but like I said before, with the accommodations, you just we really encourage you to reach out to your um, students, teachers of talking about like looking through the different types of refusals and seeing what type of accommodations that can be really helpful and talking even with like the school social worker of check-ins and just letting your child know, like we want to help you and make sure that you're getting the supports that you need, but you are making a behavioral choice not to go to school. So A, there will be some consequences, but we're also going to look into accommodations at school to help you get there. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Nicole on how to help prevent and or manage at home. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so when we're talking about parenting styles and we'll, we'll go over each style and kind of look at the pros and cons and how that's communicated to your child um, when we're seeing some of that avoidance and refusal, Really understanding that no one parent encompasses all the styles all, all at once. So um, sometimes you may, you know, be a little bit more permissive because it's, it's easier. We don't want to have a big fight um, or, you know, kind of transition to more of that authoritarian style because, again, it aligns with what the day looks like. So, when again, when discussing these styles, um, it's kind of more the messaging that's going to the child when this prevents and kind of how to reshape what you're doing to be able to make sure that 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 is targeting school refusal. And again, it's, it's coming up with that consistency and how we're messaging things. So the first style we're looking at is that authoritarian style. So this is where we're not negotiating. It's more of that you're going to school or else. So parents with this style may jump straight into the punishment. Um, that might be an extreme punishment. Like I'm going to take away your um, phone for the rest of the week um, and, and we found a lot of times this, this is born from more of that frustration and just, I met my wits in. So um, we're seeing a consistent response for the child, but it's very rigid. So there's no wiggle room. There's no discussion of, well, if you just go to the first period, then we can kind of work things through it to go to school and that's it. Um, so some concerns that come along with this style um, is that children often, instead of hearing you know, that firmness, they're just feeling like not being, I, I don't think you're listening to me. I don't think you're understanding how I'm feeling, especially when we're seeing that anxiety piece. It almost feels like a punishment for the child um, that they're not going to school. So really not feeling heard with this style. Um, sometimes kids who are parented with this style may become dishonest. 
um, and start using more of that negative communication. So I'm not going to tell you how I'm really feeling and I'll kind of just wait till the morning of um, and tell you, especially for older kids, tell you that I'm going to school and then not actually go just to avoid the punishment or the big discussion. I mean, also have, being at risk for a lower self-esteem again, because we're not using that voice. We're not really supporting independence with this style. It's more of my way or else. So kind of being able to see this, see this in yourself in these moments and being able to identify, is this being born because I'm frustrated? I, I can't get this kid to listen to me. I don't know what's going on. I really just need them to get to school um, or because you really feel like it's effective. So really taking these moments and these opportunities to look at, again, how you're communicating with your child um, and kind of focusing on the punishment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But with any kind of punishment, really making sure it's very clear what you did, how you can earn it, anything back, and being kind of flexible with what that looks like. So again, the authoritarian style, again, can be born from a lot of frustration, um, but really being aware of this and how it's communicating to your child when they are struggling it could be in the morning or the evening before. The unenvowed style, we see this a lot more um, if one if we have like more of a, a primary parent who does um more of the getting the kids ready in the morning, um, or it's just there more during the school week. So it kind of presents the kids as I don't care if you go to school or not, because I'm not really around. Again, this is not necessarily born um from a desire to not be involved. It's just we all have other responsibilities, and sometimes that can present to the, the child as um, I'm not involved with setting those limits and disciplining, and so you can't really tell me to go to school because you don't care if I go to school or not. So this style is definitely a lot more relaxed, um, but it also doesn't provide the child with really clear expectations, especially school being one of them. Um, so children who are parented with this style may engage in more of that unhealthy behavior because they don't have structure. So that might mean they're staying up a lot later, which is making it more difficult for them to get up in the morning and get out the door. Um, again, having that risk for low self-esteem, feeling really abandoned, like it's at not sharing what's causing them not, not to want to go to school. So just, you know, kind of leaning into, I'm not going to go because no one cares if I make it there or not. Um, and oftentimes parents who are not as involved don't realize their child is falling behind until the school is telling them. So when we, going back to the beginning of the presentation, when we look at um, school, please go school when it doesn't just pop up out of nowhere. Um, you might have a kid who is not going to class, but is going to nurse. So they're in the school building, but avoiding the class. And parents who aren't involved may not be able to hear that, um, may be unaware that that's happening until, again, it becomes a full-blown issue. So really making sure that parents with the cell are encouraged to be involved, not just with their child, but with the school as well, um, so we can kind of catch these red flags before they become full-blown school refusal. That permissive style, this is the one again, is born from I'm frustrated, I'm tired, fine, I don't feel like having the big fight with you, it's okay, you don't have to go to school today, um, you bargained and you're going to go tomorrow, and I believe that, and um, kids, kids respond to that, they they know that there's going to be someone going to cave, if I can just wait you out for the first, however long in the morning, you're going to cave and I can stay home, or if you tell me that there is a consequence, you're not going to follow through or remember it. So it doesn't really matter if I go or not. Um, and that's the, kind of the messaging that kids get with this kind of style. Um, it does limit arguments because there's not a big blow up because the kid doesn't go to school, but it's only for the moment. Um, we're still not having that consistency with the child. They're not knowing kind of what those limits are and expectations. And it makes school almost an option instead of I really need you to go and I want to support you with getting there. So it can be a little difficult for parents with this style to start having consistent boundaries and limits because they were not previously enforced. So really kind of starting small um, and being very, very consistent because your kid is not used to you being consistent. And so they need to see that and know that and you're gonna get that bigger pushback and that bigger reaction and being really consistent with that. And children with this, who are parents with this style may not have as much respect for authority figures and not in a defiant way, but because they know that when they get home, those consequences or expectations are not going to be reinforced. And so it makes it easier to be dismissive of teachers at school or social workers or people who are trying to support them because they know that it's, it's not going to be connected between home and school. Um, kids with this style may also struggle with developing healthy habits. So again, going back to sleep, we see so many kids are glued to their screens, as Jenna mentioned, like absolutely glued to their screens and are not getting proper sleep. 
um, or are just up talking or doing things that you know feel good and feel supportive in the moment, but because they don't have anyone kind of having that expectation of we need to have screens off, we need to be in bed and, and getting that sleep and seeing the value of it, um, aren't really following through with that. So really with this style to struggle to kind of get back on track of, yes, I was frustrated and I kind of got lacked of things where I've been very busy, but we're gonna get back to a place where we have expectations and we're gonna follow through with them. And you can expect that if I say I'm going to do something for you, whether that's support you or have to put a consequence in place, I'm going to follow through with that. So these are these are the parents um, Jen and I really, really push consistency with and make sure that there is a clear script to follow, um, clear plans to follow, just because that it can be it can be very difficult to go from being very permissive, permissive to saying, okay, I have to be a lot more not strict and say a little bit more firm. Um, and not kind of going over to the other side of, again, getting into that place of it's my way or the highway, or we're going to have these big back and forth battles. And then lastly, the ideal that I think all of those parents, we, you know, want to really have that balance. And sometimes it can be difficult and um, it can depend on the child, the time of day, all of those fun factors. Um, so with this style, you're really looking at I understand you don't want to go to school and I need you to kind of walk me through that. So this becomes more of a conversation. Um, so we're, we're parents with this style are really focusing on kind of understanding those physiological symptoms, understanding what supports they might need in class and having that conversation while also maintaining consistently and I need you to go to school. So everything coming back to, we're also going to make sure we're getting to school. So everything that I'm doing to support you with this style is to still make sure that we're getting to school. Um, the style is found to be the most effective. It really supports parents with identifying the expectation, having it in place, but also I'm, I'm demonstrating that I hear you, I, I value your voice, and I want to talk to you. And again, we're still going to go to school. So really having that expectation be consistent while identifying and accepting the other variants that the kid may be struggling with. Um, some concerns with the style is not every parent follows the style. Again, I don't think any parent follows it all the time. It can be very, very difficult to do, um, especially on days where you're frustrated, you've been dealing with this every single morning for two weeks, and it's hard to then sit down and talk about how the feeling and those pieces. So it can be a struggle, or if two parents are on different pages, um, it can it can present as coddling. Um, you know, you're just having you're making this situation lasts longer because you're having a conversation with them when they really need to get out the door. So really making sure with this style that parent, whoever is parents, family members, whoever is supporting with getting to school that we're on the same page with this one. Um, and also understanding that with this style, you are raising a child who's going to be more assertive. Um, and so that may mean that they are more vocal about expectations and not wanting to do certain things. And so again, maintaining the conversation and letting know, them know that you hear them while also making that parameter of need to get to school being a priority. So what we found are just kind of really specific things that, that you can do to address school fees on the home. Again, a lot of this is still tied to the school fees and, and what can be encouraged, but um, these are the areas that we found that if they're managed at home, um, they really help navigate school avoidance and school approval, but also empower um, both kids and parents to kind of identify the, the concerns and work on them again before they become a full blown working goal. So making sure those expectations are clear and consistent. So if I'm asking you to be at school by eight o'clock, I'm expecting that every day. That is not to say that things don't come up, but making sure that whatever you're communicating to your child, it is clear that this is a daily thing. This is not um, something that there's wiggle room on, or some days you can go at night, or some days you can go, you can, I can pick you up early, but every day, this is what I'm expecting. With the understanding that there's gonna be things that are gonna come up. So making, again, the reasonable expectations. So it's not just, that I'm asking you to do things is that if there's if you're actually genuinely feeling sick or you do need a mental health day, that's reasonable. We can discuss that, but that is the exception and is not the rule. The exception, um, I mean, the understanding that you're going to get to school, um, making sure that structure is consistent. So that could look like having a very clear morning routine, having a clear afternoon routine, um, and having it be something that the kids can come come to terms with and expect. So some families are dinner at 5 p.m., homework at 6 p.m., and if that's not doable, then that is totally okay, but making sure that there's time carved out for homework, timed out, 
have carved out for being able to spend time together, um, and that can be expected every night. And the, the other piece of the seven structure is making sure there's space for family time with no distraction. Oftentimes, we hear a lot of kids who um, are dealing with things at home that parents aren't always familiar with, and or they are asking for attention in a way that can be kind of, it's getting them negative attention. So making time for positive family interactions, having that with no expectation, I mean, no distraction, um, because then you're also modeling for your child, you know, I value our time together and I'm not going to be on my phone or doing something that's distracting to me. This space is for all of us just to spend time together. So they also get into the practice of seeing what that looks like. Because oftentimes we are asking our kids to get off the phone while we are still on our phone. Um, and so not having that space and time for with no distractions. Supporting the use of decision making and problem solving skills. A lot of um a lot of these conversations are kind of one-sided. So um, you know, your child comes to you with a concern and you have an answer for it or a solution for it. And that doesn't encourage them to identify what's holding them back and being able to work on that. Um, with school refusals, but when some kids, as we talked about the different types of people, for some kids it is, I don't want to go because home is more comfortable or I enjoy being at home more because I get to spend time with you and what's a very clear thing that they can identify and sometimes they can. And so instead of jumping right into solving the problem for them, kind of identifying what are the barriers and talking that through with them so that they can identify things that will be supportive for them, whether that's accommodations in school or things they need at home and working with them to have those things put in place. Um, really celebrating the willingness. We, Jenna is, is great with having kind of more of that exposure plan. So maybe we don't jump right into a full day of school, but we're kind of easing into it. So celebrating the willingness to get to school. If we're having a full week of non-attendance in the next week, at least on Monday, just in for a few hours, celebrating that willingness for them to, I'm going to engage in this, I'm going to try and work through it. And really collaborating and brainstorming solutions. So not just saying, this is what we're going to do. I talked to your teacher, this is what we decided, but I, this is going to be a conversation not just between parent and child, but between parent, and child, and the team at school or their therapist. So they are a part of it and it's not just something that's happening to them. Again, that also empowers them to identify the barriers for themselves and be able to communicate that and talk that through. Encouraging appropriate expressions of emotions. With this, we're talking about really validating the emotions. So I know that you're feeling anxious about going to school. Um, it feels really hard for you. And I'm going to challenge you to go. I'm going to challenge you to identify the things that you can do to support yourself, or that you can coping skill, or using the supports that are in place. So not focusing on the emotional piece, but really identifying things that are going to change your behavior. Um, if a child is feeling really anxious, and, and we're focusing so much on you need to stop feeling like that, or you need to just put out the door, it invalidates what they're telling you they're feeling. But you can feel anxious and still say, I'm going to use a coping skill right now, or my team came up with this really good, great plan for me, and I'm just going to try my best to follow it. So that is the behavior being proactive and working on things versus I'm feeling this and it's a tough thing I can do. If they're really frustrated and they're telling you that in the morning, giving them an alternative, something, an acceptable way. So we're not having that big explosion in the morning, but more of you can talk to me. We can have a conversation. You can tell me that you're frustrated. So kind of giving them other things to do. For some kids that might be going for a run in the morning, some kids might might need, you know, just space to be alone for a little bit in the morning because I'm frustrated, I don't want to be around anyone, and I know I have to go to school. So give them other ways to be able to communicate that or experience that frustration while still focusing on the goal of getting out the door to get to school and really encouraging engagement and communication. That also comes back to the problem solving piece so you're not just giving them answers or really faulting them for how they're feeling, but saying, you know, I hear you and I can't support you if I don't know what's going on. So I need you to tell me, I need you to talk to me, um, and providing space for that. It may not be right that moment. They may have really big feelings, big emotions, and be really, really frustrated. And maybe that's not a great time to have that conversation, but it's totally okay. Making sure that they know I want to hear about it. I want to talk about it. And I'd like to do that before we have to head out the door in the morning versus um, I'd like to do that beforehand. So I'm not asking you to not tell me, but we need to have this conversation like the night before or over the weekend. So really encouraging them to open up and share that so they're not waiting and having it all bottled up and being and having a really difficult time 
um, navigating this later. Slowing time management. This can be really, really frustrating for kids who don't know how to navigate this. And I think as adults, we also struggle with this. Um, if you are already having a difficult time in school and not wanting to get there, and also knowing that you're behind on your work or constantly coming into class late, that can make that anxiety around school when school is a that more prominent. So um, first of all, acknowledging the stress is falling behind. So I know that this is scary to me, this is difficult. We want to get you caught up and saying, you know, this is a conversation we need to have with your team at school. How we're going to get you caught back up if you've missed a week or a few days or a few days every week for a few months. But we want to make sure we have a really good plan and acknowledging that's going to be stressful and it's going to be difficult and we're going to figure out a way to do it. Um, encouraging those executive functioning skills. So if, if it's doable, um, I, there are a ton of really great YouTube videos on executive functioning. If you can have an executive functioning coach or just kind of working closely with someone at the school to support that, really understanding that it's different and, and more stressful for some kids than others. So identifying, again, what that barrier is and what still we really need to focus on and modeling time management yourself. So Again, not every family is able to have we wake up, have breakfast, talk for a few minutes, and then head out the door. Sometimes it's a little bit more hectic, hectic in that. So finding something that can be consistent, a thread that goes through the entire week of this is what the mornings look like, this is what the evenings typically look like, um, and this is when you can have time for yourself, but also time to get things done. So making sure that that time management is modeled for them, um, even if that means, you know, if you have some things to finish up for work, we're going to all sit around the table and work on that. Or I like to take some time in the morning to myself, so I'm gonna. I want you to have space to do that too. So they really see what that looks like, the benefit of it, but also knowing that it's not an expectation just that you have for them, but that you have for yourself and your entire. And then kind of going back to um, what Jenna mentioned about what motivates your child. So um, we found a lot of families. Um, it's either consequence or incentive. It's, it's never really. Um, a sprinkle of both. It's, it's usually I'm taking things away or I'm giving you something. Um, the first and, and most crucial point is making sure that the child has science for that. Um, so if we're if we're trying to motivate them, let's say by screen time, and that's not working, that's probably something they don't care about. So having a conversation with them about what do you care about? What are you when you're not at school? What are you worried about? If it's, I'm going to school because I don't want to use my phone, lose my phone. Okay, then that's a consequence that motivates them. It could be something academic, like I I don't want to have all F, and so I'll go to school because you keep reminding me that my grades are really important and I care about that. Or I can't do basketball or cheerleading or STEM club if I'm not at school, and that motivates me. So kind of working with them to identify things they actually care about versus just saying, well, I'm going to take your phone away. Because that's an easy go-to, but again, not all kids care about that um, or don't care about it enough in the moment to actually get to school. We always encourage um, identifying school-based motivators first because that's where we kind of get them to go. So if there's a club they're in or um, something we've been working really hard on that they want to they want to be get present for, um, a preferred class, a preferred teacher, um, seeing friends at recess, catching up with friends that they see in class, any of that kind of being able to start there um, because it's connected to school and, and that's what we kind of want them to focus on. Um, and also, again, knowing what motivation is how. So if they can't identify anything, it is okay to kind of move forward. But really focusing on, we want to encourage positive behavior. So if in the past, my child was very receptive to having incentives or a reward, then kind of starting that way and not automatically jumping into consequences, because oftentimes it can feel like you're being punished for not getting to school. And Again, not every child responds to that the same way. And also children and adolescents, as we know, care about different things or motivated by different things. So the thing your child cared about two years ago may not still be relevant to them later. So really having this conversation with them, getting as much insight from them as possible, they may not necessarily tell you um, what consequences feel good for them, but again, having the conversation so it's not just um, something that you're putting in front of them that again, they do not care about or are not interested in. So really being able to identify that. Um, when we're looking at consequences and incentives, we, um, again, as I mentioned, circle a lot of that around um, resources that we provide for families. So I will let Jenna speak to kind of what, the, again, what those supports can look like at home. I know we have some examples of what we use in the past. 
Yeah, so thanks, Nicole. So the first one <clears throat> that we're going to go over is bring it home with refusal due to school-based triggers or social and evaluative situations. Now with these kiddos, really that anxiety is coming through. So coming up with more of an incentive plan, because a lot of times you'll hear kids or adolescents in the morning saying, you're punishing me for having anxiety, or you're punishing me for not going to school because I feel this way. And really, we want to look at we want to support you. So here's like an incentive plan that really focuses on staying in school and supporting and using those accommodations that they have in the school setting. And then if they're not going to school, really just explaining that wording of, we have these supports for you at school. We're supporting you at home and you're making that behavioral choice. So we're hearing you and there's always going to be consequences to whatever behaviors we have, whether positive or negative. Um, and so coming up with a reward chart for using in-school supports um, appropriately, such as like time with their social worker. One thing that we've created for kiddos in the past is a check-in tracker. Um, so like the goal for the week is no more than checking in one time, one time a day with the social worker. So like we said, using those supports they have in class. And then if they feel like they really need to leave, then going seeing that social worker, but no more than one to two times a day. And coming up with the tracker of like, did I check in today? Yes, no. How many times? Tools I tried first. So deep breathing. What coping skills did you try? Did you check in with your teacher first? Um, and then coming up with an incentive if they've met their goal. So really giving them some accountability, but also excitement to meet their goal for the week. And then having like a weekly tracker of classroom attendance with like an end of the week in, um, incentive for consistent attendance. Now we want to make sure we're not going like, above and beyond with incentives, like you're not going to get $100 a day every single time you go to school. Um, so really coming up with a feasible plan, like if they like to go to a specific place on the weekend, if you go to school, you know, you can start if you have a severe refuser, you can start with if you've made it three to four days this week, we can go to this place or you can have this time with your friends or we can have your friends over, do something special. If it's more of like a mochi thing, like you can have a mochi each day. So whatever motivates your child, but really coming up and incorporating, like Nicole said, incorporating them into that plan gives them that accountability and responsibility. Uh, just adding to that, um, a lot of times with reward cards, and these are going to be for you know your younger middle school age children. Um, really identifying if they are more motivated by having a daily incentive, a weekly incentive, or a long-term goal. Um, because some kids kind of lose focus and will stop caring, or some want to work towards something big. You know, daily incentives just don't feel as, as encouraging or motivating. Um, so really being able to identify and, and knowing your kid is okay. What's going like? Do you want to work towards something big, or are we kind of doing this day to day? Um, and with older kids, really making sure it's. It's something age appropriate. Um, if it's not, if it's not a reward that they're motivated by, this is not going to be successful. So with that, that can be, especially with older kids, that can be more of a conversation of okay, what do you want? What do you what will be most motivating for you? And like Jenna said, if it's like not like a thousand dollars or anything like that, but something that's feasible, um, that would kind of be in place. I've had a lot of parents say, um, I don't feel comfortable bribing my kids to get to school. And I always phrase it as to go to work every day and get paid for that. That is not a bribe. That is a mo that's a piece of being motivated for you. This is something that's motivating for them. And it's not forever. It's something a reward chart might be in place like for the first few weeks, for the first month, and then being able to kind of pull that back. So not having these plans in place forever, but just enough time when you can get consistently, you see that they're able to do it, they're able to navigate it, and then being able to kind of pull that back a little bit. Yeah. And just one more thing to add to Nicole is like when you, if you're giving like a huge incentive one or two days or the first week that they go to school. So we've had a family that gave a kid a drum set or a puppy that went to school for a week or two. And then there's really no motivation. They've the end all be all they've gotten what they wanted. There's really no motivation to go to school in the long, um, past that. And so really building up to it, having those baby steps and like we said before, if your child is at that severe stage, if they've gone to school for one or two days that week, that is a huge stride. If they were missing five days before, really, really talking with them and supporting them and encouraging them and giving them praise for going to school those one of two days. Otherwise, if you're really looking at the negative aspect of it, kids are going to feed off of that and think, well, I went a day or two, but I'm in trouble for not going 
all five days at this point, they're not going to find that motivation to go. So you really just need those baby steps and to meet them where they're at. And then the next one, this is kind of where we lay down the law sometimes with some of those behaviors. Um, and so this is something that we've created. It's a refusal due to attention at home or positive reinforcements at home. So like I mentioned before, we see this a lot with working parents or single parents that have absolutely no choice but to go to school or to work, excuse me. Um, and so really what we want to look at is talking to your child of, if you go to school, this is you know what your day will look like, or this is what you can have. If you don't go to school, this is what your day is going to look like or your weekend, and it's gonna come with consequences. And so coming up with like, if you're staying home all day, this is what you're going to need to do. If another family member or someone can come over and just not babysit, but make sure they're on track of having them, you know, be out of bed and dressed by whatever time school starts, we always encourage that. We don't encourage them being in their room. All electronics and preferred leisure items are put away or taken to work with you all. Um, complete all missed and current assignments from school. If time allows, they can complete a chore at home. If you're able to stay home a day or two, bringing your child to a library or somewhere outside of the home to get them some exposure. If that's not feasible, I know a lot of times, you know, kids will say, I don't care if you take everything away, but eventually they're going to want something back. So something that we emphasize a lot is short-term fits equals long-term success. No kid's going to really enjoy a plan and no parent really enjoys implementing a plan at first because it's really hard and it's the follow through is hard because if you're a single parent, if you're working parents, it's just, it's, it's really tough. And so really in those first few weeks or that month that you're seeing your child start in that preventative phase of reporting, not wanting to go to school or refusal, it's really important to follow through and be consistent with a plan. And then the next that we've created is an attendance contract. And this is something that really demonstrates that school and home and or if your child's in a program are all collaborating, like an outpatient therapist, a partial hospitalization program. Something that is so important for children to see is that you are all on the same team for them. If they're saying that parents don't care if I go to school and then school is implementing consequences, vice versa, they're going to kind of feed off of that. And sometimes we call it like splitting. And so you really want to work with the school and or whatever program your child is attending or the outpatient therapist and making sure that they're all on the same team. And so something that we've created is like an attendance contract. So for example, you know, we have the student sign it, we have a parent sign it, we have a teacher or a social worker sign it. And having a visual is so important, not only for your child, but also for you. So you can make sure, you know, you have a script in the morning. So just reminding your child, if you arrive at school on time, you will have full privileges at home. If you arrive to your first period class, I will lose my phone maybe for 30 minutes and then keep all other privileges. If I arrive before my second class, I will lose my phone privileges for the evening and keep all other privileges. Um, if I'm unable to arrive at all, it will count as a refusal day and I will follow the refusal day agenda. Now, sometimes it will get to the point in that first stage, you can really look at like if they make it a half day, great, but there can be some point where they're not making it by their first two periods. It's a cutoff and it's okay, you're a refusal at home day, you're losing your privileges and this is what it looks like. Um, and so sometimes Nicole and I agree and disagree on some of the things that we talk about, mainly with um, the consequences. So like, I'm a firm believer, like if they're not attending that full day, then those privileges are taken away. And then I'll let Nicole, just because then there's a little bit more motivation to go that next day. And if they're getting their privileges that day, they can say, oh, well, I didn't go because we've had families before. Well, school's over at 3 p.m. and they get all their privileges. Well, at this point, if I don't go to school all day and I'm getting them at three o'clock, what is my motivation? What is the point to go to school the next day? And then I'll toss it over to Nicole because she does have a good point as well. So I fully support that for some cases. For some kids, I think I'm a huge proponent of being able to turn it around. So understanding that this could have been just a really rough day, you 
followed all the expectations of those things with the agenda. You got your homework done. You went on any devices. You got any chores done. And so your refusal date ends when the school day ends. Um, and so then being able to resume all privileges. Jen and I, again, we do differ on this, but I do agree that this is definitely for uh, less extreme cases. So if we are, you know, maybe having a one-off day where I've, I've been going to school for a month, I still really struggle today, I'm following again. No pushback on the agenda. It's letting them see a point where they can kind of turn it around. Um, we do incur this on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, after much debate between Jen and I, we'll then say, okay, this is what we're thinking this should look like um, based on kind of where things are at. And understanding again that every child is different. Um, and if this is something that's happening consistently, absolutely saying no, this goes for the entire day. But again, if it's a one off or we're kind of not at that full blown refusal, we're just seeing it a little bit, being able to support them by saying, okay, you can turn it around, but this can't be an every single day where you do what you need to do till three and then you get all your privileges back because that can be kind of productive. Yeah. yeah. And really looking at to like, have we gotten to the underlying cause of what the refusal is? Because, you know, if a kid is just expressing and starting that phase, and if they don't go to school for a few days and it's, you've lose, lost your phone forever, that's just going to strive that anxiety a little bit more of having, feeling like that child is not getting supportive, but also understanding, yes, there are of course consequences to our behaviors, but we really want to take a step back and say, okay, what's this underlying cause? Is it truly like anxiety within the school? Is it something at home and figuring that out? And once we've kind of figured that out and nipped it, we can then go forward with the plan. Oh, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, again, we are very, very passionate about this topic. Um, we do offer resources and supports on our website and we are always happy to talk to families um, and identify more personalized supports um, that we can develop. Um, so yes, we appreciate you all having us. If you have any questions about any of this or feedback, feel free to ask them now or I'll let Anne speak to kind of what that process looks like. Yeah. Does anyone have any question? We have a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions or scenarios they wanted to get some input on? You could just unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. While people are thinking. Um, one question that um, you come up is, why do you think this is becoming such an issue now? I, I hate to bring point forward for everything, um, but for this, I feel that it just became easier. It became easier to, to see, number one, that I can get all my schoolwork done at home or I can figure everything out without having to leave my home. So if that's an option, why are you making it easy? Um, I think that kind of applies more to the older kids. I also think we're a lot more aware of mental health now than we were a few years ago. Um, and so it's not a, it's less of a, a a shameful or hidden thing and, and less like, well, you just have to go to school. And now it's more of a discussion between parents and children. And so I think because it is, um, we're we're just seeing it be a lot more pronounced. I do again, but I do feel like COVID did depending on the age group, I feel like it really impacted being able to, you know, do things from the comfort of your home and have that experience and just then not want to leave or saying that I'm going back to school, but my parents are still able to work from home. How is that fair? How does that make sense? So I think depending on, you know, kind of that function of the school to so can do this sometimes. I think a lot of it does come back to that time of being at home and education and, and engagement with peers looks a lot different than it did before. Um, and it's, it's, it's made this more prevalent. Yeah. And just to add on to that, I think, you know, kids have a lot more access to things these days and make it more desirable to stay at home. A lot more access to video games, to phones, everything that they could possibly want. And so staying home is just really more fun and appealing to kids than going to school. They're able to socialize a lot more through phones, through electronics, through video games, where in the olden days, we had to go to school to socialize. And so they find ways around that of just making home a lot more pleasurable and comfortable. And then also just to be fully transparent, I think a lot of times school districts nowadays are a lot more lenient with attendance. I know they're starting to hone in a lot more, but a lot more lenient, like we've seen, and we highly don't encourage this, but we've seen clients before miss 75 days and be able to graduate. And so we really want to educate 
educate the schools as well of how important attendance is not only for your child's education, but socially as well, especially like I think in the elementary and middle school grades, we hone in a lot on academics, but we forget that socializing and just learning how to interact is a huge portion of that. And then when we're getting into those high school ages, of course, that socialization is important, but the academics as well. So do you think this is something that should be a, like a proactive discussion for every parent at the beginning of the semester? Like these are expectations around attendance, or do you think that's kind of creating a problem or an option in their head that wasn't even there? Having the conversation about and having those regular check-ins of like the end of the summer, how are you feeling about going back to school? Many things make you uncomfortable. So, so not so much the you're going to school and this is the expectation, but is there anything that made last school year hard? Is there anything that would have felt easier? Are you nervous about transitioning to middle school where bells would be ringing and you'll have to leave class at certain times? So being proactive about having a conversation around if there's anything concerning so they know that discussion is there. I do think um, another piece of this is kids being more aware of like it's okay to talk about how you feel. So rather than just kind of saying, I'm going to just get through the day and being miserable at school, it's no, I can tell people how I feel and I'm not going to school. Um, so I think having those conversations proactively and being able to identify anything that's making them even remotely anxious about school or uncomfortable, so they know that, that can be an ongoing conversation that you're having. Thank you. Well, I think I think that's all the questions that I had had sent to me. Um, if anyone has anything else, I think that you have your information there. They can reach out to you guys directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was really interesting to learn about and um, discover more um, techniques and suggestions of, of how to help kiddos in these situations. Um, thank you both for being part of it. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, we will send, we have everyone's email, so we'll send you a copy of um, the presentation as well as information on upcoming GRIT projects and activities. If anyone has thoughts on another presentation, another topic they'd like information on, please put it in the chat or email us. Um, we're always looking to um, bring information and support to the community. So thank you so much and everyone have a good night. Thanks everyone so much. Thank you. Thank you.